this week on the show, we have Martin Luther King III and his wife, Andrea Waters King. Martin is the oldest son of iconic civil rights activists, Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for watching. This show is all about giving you insights and showcasing brands that help you to live your best life and give you confidence. As always, I want to kickstart your morning with some motivational advice to help you to feel inspired and energized to start your day. Today, I want to talk about the importance of learning to make resilience your superpower. The reality is failure and obstacles in life are inevitable, but the more you learn to bounce back from those failures, the more you grow into a person of great fortitude because of your strength and perseverance. One of the most important traits that successful leaders and trailblazers share is their ability to be resilient in the face of adversity. Whether it was Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi, facing adversity with strength and courage without letting defeat get the best of them was their strong suit. Make your mission today to muster up your personal power when faced with challenges and use your resilience to shine brighter than you did before, using your past failures as wisdom and motivation. As Barack Obama quotes, the real test is not whether you avoid this failure, because you won't. It's whether you let it harden or shame you into an action, or whether you learn from it, whether you choose to persevere. Stay tuned, coming up after the break. So let's start off with Martin. Um, what are the most fondest memories you have of your dad, Martin Luther King Jr. growing up? So the fondest memories I have, of course, uh, would be uh, in the earlier years, which would be somewhere around 1963, 64. Uh, we used to ride our bicycles uh, in, um, in Atlanta when there was no expressway, which I-75, I-85, Interstate 75, 85, goes through downtown Atlanta. We could ride our bicycles from our home then uh, all the way to uh, a, a monument called, well, a, a, one of the hospitals in Atlanta, uh, Grady Hospital. And I remember that. I remember going to the YMCA with dad to uh, where he would engage in exercise and, and we would swim. He taught us how to swim. I remember playing uh, football and baseball in the front yard. And, uh, and then finally, uh, I remember traveling with dad on several occasions, uh, probably six or seven times. Um, I traveled probably seven and my brother, I think, went about five times. Uh, so those were truly fond memories. Very nice. Wardrobe provided by Le Chateau. Next up on the show, we have Martin Luther King III and his wife, Andrea Waters King. Martin is the oldest son of the iconic civil rights activist Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. Martin and Andrea, thank you so much for being on the show today. How are you both doing? We're doing wonderful. We're doing well. <laughs> thank you for having us. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you for being here. It's honestly an honor to speak with both of you. And I'm really excited about this one. So let's start off with Martin. Um, what are the most fondest memories you have of your dad, Martin Luther King Jr. growing up? So the fondest memories I have, of course, uh, would be uh, in the earlier years, which would be somewhere around 1963, 64. Uh, we used to ride our bicycles 
uh, in uh, in Atlanta when there was no expressway, which I-75, I-85, Interstate 75, 85, goes through downtown Atlanta. We could ride our bicycles from our home then uh, all the way to uh, a, a monument called, well, uh, one of the hospitals in Atlanta, uh, Grady Hospital. And I remember that. I remember going to the YMCA with Dad to... Uh, where he would engage in exercise and, and we would swim. He taught us how to swim. I remember playing uh, football and baseball in the front yard. And, uh, and then finally, uh, I remember traveling with Dad on several occasions, uh, probably six or seven times. Um, I traveled probably seven, and my brother, I think, went about five times. Uh, so those were truly fond memories. Very nice. And Andrea, how do you feel that Martin's work has influenced you uh, into the person you are today as well? My Martin, or well, <laughs> I, I say that I was we we met in this work. Um, so I was involved for many years. I worked for an organization um, that actually was co-founded by one of Martin's father's um, closest lieutenants, and we monitored hate groups and and hate crimes. Um, so there has always been, I think, from my formative years in Florida and um, with my parents, you know, a, certainly a desire to serve and a desire to really um, stand and serve humanity. Mm -hmm. And Martin, I also want to ask you that of how your father's work has influenced you into the man you are today and your work with civil rights. Well, I, you know, actually, um, just having a front row seat uh, for the many activities of the modern civil rights movement, seeing my mother and father engaged. Uh, they were a true partnership. In fact, this year, uh, in January, uh, a statue was dedicated and actually monument in their honor in Boston, Massachusetts. But the two of them met uh, when he was at BU working on his PhD and mom was at the Boston Conservatory working on a degree, her master's degree in music. Uh, they met and had a conversation maybe five or six hours at the first meeting and mom had already really been involved in the peace movement and had done demonstrations whereas dad at that time had not. So he, he said, you know, really my wife sort of uh, was first and foremost and, and brought me to this, but they had read a lot of the same books, so they were able to have these great depthful conversations. Uh, my higher point being that because my mom and father and mother was always counsel, in, in one sense, uh, dad and mother would, would counsel each other, and because of that uh, and seeing the strategic moves that dad made Mom was often going around helping to raise money for the organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, it made an indelible impact on my life in relationship to service, so that I believe that to him or her that much is given, of him or her is much required. And therefore, uh, I've always been involved in, in social justice. Whenever I see something that's wrong, uh, I, I've had this compelling desire to do all that I can uh, to correct that which is wrong. Mm -hmm. And Andrea, you've been a passionate leader for the fight um, against injustice and inequality for those that are marginalized alongside Martin. So let's talk about your work as president of the Drum Major Institute. Yes, Drum Major Institute, we actually take our name from the very last sermon that Martin's father ever delivered at Ebenezer Baptist Church um, on February 4th. 1968, literally two months um, to the day before he was assassinated. And what is so powerful, we believe, is that after he was assassinated and Martin's mother was putting together his funeral service, um, and it came time to choose um, something either to write or to um, have played, she, going through all of his many sermons and his many speeches and writings, she didn't choose I Have a Dream as phenomenal as it is, or nor even the mountaintop speech, or you know, just so many great speeches. What she did choose was the drum major instinct sermon. Um, and in that sermon, Dr. King talked about how he wanted to be remembered. 
and that he and what it was to live a, a life dedicated um, to peace and justice and equity. And in a very real sense, he eulogized himself because that was the very last thing played at his funeral in his voice. And what we believe at Drum Major is that that call is our pursuit for this generation. We, we talk about the eradication of the triple evils and what we believe is that it's through embracing peace, justice, and equity that we will you know, once and for all, in a very real sense, create the beloved community that Martin's parents not only taught us, but also um, lived and worked for in their lifetime. And, and also lastly, you know, we, you think about the fact that I know sometimes people get frustrated and, you know, even with us because, you know, some of these battles or, you know, we feel that we have, or Martin's parents or, you know, people who have been on the front lines of democracy for so long. But Martin's mother talked about the fact that freedom is never really won. It's a never ending struggle. Mm -hmm. And we really believe that each generation, we kind of see freedom and democracy as this burning eternal flame. And it really is up to each generation to do their part to, to feed the flames. Absolutely. And I want to talk about, you know, as you said, there's so much inequality happening in the U.S. Um, I feel like with George Floyd, it really became a global movement, Black Lives Matter, um, where people really realize the seriousness of what's happening. So how do we close the gap of inequality? What are some steps that we can do uh, to prevent situations like this happening? First of all, uh, we've got to look at and change the trajectory of how we uh, we study and learn and incorporate real history. Uh, you may be aware that uh, or out of nowhere, all of a sudden political leaders have, ris have raised an issue in, and in my judgment, in the wrong way, uh, which is they identify as critical race theory, which really is a concept that is taught at the collegiate and university level. It has, in fact, it's taught in law school. It really is not primary and secondary school. But politically, it's a political issue. So it makes sense for some to enumerate and elaborate uh, and expound upon and saying this is a, not a good issue. And therefore, what they're doing is they're erasing the history, the true history of this nation and qual uh, qualifying it in a racial context as opposed to saying, all of this has taken place. How do we know about it, learn, so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past? It is said that a people that do not remember their history are doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. So I think we have, first have to start at a place and understand uh, the history of our nation. And that is really of every ethnic group, not just of one. Uh, but in this context, you're only talking about in relationship to black history and saying we're not going to teach about slavery. We're not going to teach about Rosa Parks. We're not going to teach the I Have a Dream speech of Martin Luther King. Uh, all of this really is, in my judgment, way past. It, it's, it's beyond what we should be doing. We are a better nation than that, uh, ultimately creating a better world. That's part of where we start, but we also have to teach and train civics and ethics uh we we need what my dad would have called was a revolution of values uh so that we can make our society more wholesome his last book was entitled where do we go from here chaos or community we are seeing chaos everywhere we turn every day but we must humankind must work toward community uh part of what dad did and mom was they taught us how to use the model of nonviolence, how to teach people to live together without destroying person or property. And we as a society need to learn nonviolence so that we won't have to face non-existence. But again, this is where we begin. Um, and we've got a long way to go to really begin to get some traction. Uh, but the fact of the matter is conflict resolution has not really ever been taught in schools, not really, maybe it was surfacely taught for a few moments. We need it now probably more than ever. Uh, then we need to teach people diversity, sensitivity, uh, in, inclusion, human relations. 
Uh, all of those things help, I think, to create a better society. And Arndria, what's your take on this, on, on closing the gap of inequality? I think that um, one of the things that has always happened um, during movements is that you have an inevitable backlash um, against perceived gains. And in a very real sense, I feel that that's where we are today. So it, it as uplifting as it was to see the discussions happening around George Floyd and you know the glimmers of hope that happened, it wasn't a total surprise to also then see the inevitable backlash. But I think that whenever you're talking about um, creating a new way of being um, for all of us, it really is about joining a coalition of consciousness. Um, it really is about standing for what's right. It, it really is about um, there's certain legislation that I think that we should always have in place to protect um, the freedoms of us all. We believe that laws should lift us all up, not li limit us. Unfortunately, what we're seeing um, too often um, is laws that are limiting rights. Mm -hmm. So we certainly want to um, continue to push and stand for laws that, that lift us all up. And at the same time, we also have to, when you're talking about legislative things that could, can be done and should be done. And then also there is the legislation of the heart. Mm -hmm. And I think that each one of us have um, every day in small to large ways, you know, ways of standing for peace, for justice um, and for equity. And when we are standing for something, rather than being against something, when we also understand that this is all about our collective, it's not about collective guilt, but it is about collective responsibility, mm -hmm. then we will be, and when we, and when we also see ourselves as part of the King legacy, um, and we do our part, each of us have a unique role or a unique way in bringing about the beloved um, community of Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King, but we each have um, the responsibility to do so. And once we are doing all of those things in concert together, we truly believe that we will have a world in which we, we all um, would want to live in and want our children and our children's children um, to also inhabit. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of Martin Luther King's legacy was about, you know, choosing nonviolence and kindness in the face of adversity and hate. You know, how do we remember this messaging in the face of adversity? Because, you know, we see so much, you know, as they say, a darkness cannot put out darkness, only light can. So let's talk about that messaging and kind of remembering this in uh, hard times. Well, one of the first things I think that um, gets um, lost often is the remembrance that Martin, that nonviolence is not about non-action. Mm, yeah. Martin Luther King Jr. saw what was wrong in this world and then he took action to make it right. Um, nonviolence is not a way of pa being a pacifist. Um, it is about, when you think about, not only as it relates to Martin Luther King, but when you think about the work of Mahatma Gandhi, of, of whom he was greatly inspired, mm -hmm. that you want, we understand that it's about, um, Gandhi used to call it satyagraha, soul force. And so, um, and even during the civil rights movement, that all the activists were trained um, in nonviolence. And, and the reason that I bring that up is I think that it is something that you have to almost, you have to choose daily. You have to put on um, love daily. You have to drench yourself in you know, the works of Martin Luther King Jr. or Mahatma Gandhi or, whom, or Nelson Mandela or whomever. There are so many wonderful freedom fighters, but you have to be deliberate um, in choosing the way of nonviolence, choosing the way of love, and also be knowledgeable that the way of nonviolence and love is not non-action. Mm -hmm. I think that's very good advice. Martin, what's your take on this? So I would, um, I would also maybe perhaps add that we know the journey of a thousand miles begins you know with the first steps and today we are socialized through um, you know technology technology 
is not being used at its highest level yet. It's being used from time to time. But mostly technology is being used uh, often in a neutral way or a counterproductive way. So we need to look at how we use technology to, to mobilize movements. For example, we may remember, you know, so much has happened, but during the uh, Arab Spring where uh, hundreds of thousands of people gathered uh, to protest in a nonviolent way. Um, when we do these massive demonstrations, when we look at what Greta Thornburg has done around climate in terms of the world, because people have been able to see it, when we look at little Miss Flint here in the U.S. who raised the issue about uh, the quality of the water that people were drinking and dying. When we look at what the Parkland students, Douglas Stoneman and Douglas Stoneman High School in Parkland, Florida, were able to galvanize and mobilize in this country around levels of gun safety, although we didn't meet reach the mark yet, and unfortunately, it feels like it's getting worse now. And once again, we're going to have to re reemerge, reorganize. When we look at the fact that our last election cycle, uh, there were a number of candidates who were running for secretaries of state, and they were running as election deniers. All of them lost. That meant that people of goodwill stood up and said, we want democracy. We don't want people who would be elected to office who have that kind of agenda. So it, what it says is we incrementally are making some progress, but we've got a long way to go. Now, that doesn't really deal with nonviolence per se, because I really believe that, again, we've got to look at our school system and dis define, okay, how do we create a curriculum around nonviolence? How do we create a curriculum that promotes love and not hate? As you talked about, darkness can't put out darkness, only light can do that. Violence can't stomp out violence, only nonviolence or love can do that. And that has to be obviously promoted in a, in a massive way. And so why shouldn't we start in kindergarten or nursery school and teach that level uh, of, of engagement all the way through, through uh, high school and, and, and maybe even into college? I think if we could demonstrate and do that uh, for 10 or 12 years, we would see a totally different society. We, we, would, be, we would be thrust uh, into a different, tr uh, a different uh, and well, a different energy. I'll just say a different energy. Yeah. Absolutely. I want to talk about your daughter, Yolanda King. I know that she's quite the activist herself. She's already uh, been on CNN, uh, Good Morning America. So how does it feel to see, you know, your father or Martin Luther King's legacy kind of live on through her and the next generation? Angie, let's start with you. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I have, that we have tried to instill in Yolanda, even before she could talk, was that Yes, being the, the grandchild and, and, and the only grandchild of Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King is unique. Um, but then we go on to tell her, but there's something that's unique about each one of us. You know, it might be, you know, something about our family or it might be a particular talent or it might be, you know, something, you know, a unique, something unique about the way we look. But each one of us has something unique. What makes us special is who each one of us are mm -hmm. as a child of God. Yeah. And so what I what we hope is that yes, she is very proud of her grandparents and and her legacy, but that she also understands that her speci specialness comes from who she is. And um even at oh my gosh, in um elementary school she was being, you know, interviewed and, you know, you never know <laughs> what questions are going to be asked and certainly what's going to come out. And they asked her, do you want to follow in your grandfather's footsteps? And and even at in the third grade, or she said, or fourth grade, she said, you know, yes, to a certain degree, because I feel that the legacy is important and his footsteps are important, but I want to make, I'm going to make my own footsteps. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, and that, that sums up um, Yolanda, I think that she, you know, is is born and has a natural desire 
um, to serve a natural desire for humanity. She's not unique in the sense that a lot of her peers, I see you know, a lot of kids and teens that are really very not concerned and active about um, the world. And I, I really have no doubt that we are witnessing truly one of the greatest, I think history will show that this generation um, that is you know, coming on the stage now will truly be one of the greatest generations that this world has ever seen. Uh, and for our viewers that, you know, they're seeing inequality and injustice happening on TV and they feel that they're helpless and they want to, you know, stand up for something, but they feel that they can't. What would you say to inspire them? Um, I think to find what it is that you're most passionate about, to find a way to use your voice. The thing, um, as Martin stated earlier, there are a lot of um, concerns and issues with social media, but it also is a way to to um, unite um, and to 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 get information. There are a lot of wonderful organizations that are doing great work. Seek them out in your community. There are national organizations that are doing great work. Seek them out. Um, see how you can be involved. And in, if you're in school, still in your school, be the change that you want to see. Um, if you're a parent, you know, be the change and, and for, for your, your kids, get involved, show them and talk to them about the possibility of the, the greatness in all of us. Yeah. We are constantly having um, not only programs, but, you know, initiatives. This year happens to be the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington and the delivering of I Have a Dream speech. And so um, the Drum Major Institute along with National Action Network and other organizations will be convening in um, Washington in August. And we're coming together to stand for democracy, to stand for a world in which all of us um, belong and in which peace and justice and equity thrive. You're always more than welcome to come in peace um, and to come and stand with us, with your families, um, but there are numerous ways to get involved you you find you can start small find that and and every single day just do something something to make the the dream of martin luther king jr um a reality mm -hmm. and martin what's your take so ev everyone <clears throat> you know can do something uh what uh i found for most of us is we must identify our own passion. Uh, my father captured it by saying, if, if you want to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo Car Marble, sweep streets like Beethoven composed music, sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry, sweep streets like Raphael painted pictures, sweep streets so well that all the hosts of the heavens and earth uh, would have to pause and say, here to live the great street sweeper that did their job well. So the first thing we have to do is to find out what motivates us, because we all can be concerned about something. Maybe it's bullying and creating a different climate so that other people are not mistreated. Maybe it's tutoring, helping someone uh, with math or science or any area of learning. Maybe it's working with seniors. Uh, and helping them, whether it's getting, helping them to go th grocery shopping or helping them remove packages or clean their homes. Maybe it's just the environment, cleaning up the neighborhood and, and changing, helping to change the quality of life around the air and the water that we drink. But you've got to find your passion, what it is that motivates you every day that you want to do to make the world better. And as I said, it does not have to be a monumental task. It can be something very small, because quite frankly, if all of us were doing just a little bit, the entire nation and world would be a better place. And so that's the thing I would encourage. The other thing is, you know, it's important to, we are maybe to some degree seekers in life. We we have to seek, it's, a, it's like a search. Uh, sometimes it transitions to a rescue. What we're seeking, uh, knowledge is something that you perhaps can engage in each and every day. The moment one stops being willing to learn, thinks they know everything, thinks they may know everything, uh, I'm not sure what happens at that point because 
theoretically, we should never get there. So you should always be in quest and in search of knowledge and seeking, seeking truth, seeking and to create the environment where truth uh, can emerge. I mean, we live in a nation in the United States where millions of people are living in poverty. And yet we also have um, significant amounts of millionaires, opulence, every city you go to, you see these amazing buildings. And yet you also have homeless people. And in theory, that makes no sense. So it's clear that we just have not focused on the eradication of poverty as a society. Um, you know, oftentimes elected officials talk about the middle class, the middle class. But we've got to have a campaign that is focused on creating the climate where poor people can, in fact, lift themselves up, lift themselves up by their own bootstraps. Uh, it, it really is difficult to do in society today, meaning to lift yourself up on by your own bootstraps when you don't even have any boots. Uh, and that's, you know, my father used to say, that's cruel just to say to a bootless man, lift yourself up by your own boots. Uh, but we can create that kind of environment where people may be able uh, to lift themselves up uh, by their own bootstraps. But it really all begins with an idea. It also may take a strategic plan, which is a further document uh, that I think we we must develop as it relates to our society at, uh, at, at large. Uh, but it also, I'm very excited because we've got all of these young people who are engaged in change and want to change the nation, want to change the, the planet for the better. Uh, that is just amazing. And there's an exorbitant amount of energy, an exorbitant amount of vision. When you think about it, uh, in the U.S., I, I don't know how it works in other nations, but we have the ROTC, a military installation, installation, excuse me, insta, a, a military uh, deal. And uh, when you go through uh, high school and college, when you graduate from college in the ROTC, you are a commanding officer in the military, which is a lieutenant. So you are in charge of a platoon of officers. Uh, it could be 15, it could be 20 people. The higher point is, as you graduate to that level, you are leading. Well, we also need young people to lead as school board members, as county commissioners, as state legislative officers, maybe even as mayors of some smaller communities. We have a young mayor in one of the cities. I think the youngest is about 18. So if you can you know, lead when you get out of college and graduate, you can certainly start leading now. It's never too early to get engaged uh, and be a part of creating the change that you want to see. Absolutely. I, I like that advice that, you know, to find something you're passionate about and do small steps. You don't have to do anything monumental. You can just start small, whether it's, you know, getting involved in your community or something small, just to take small steps to start. So I think that's great advice. And, you know, I created my platform to inspire, to uplift, um, and to be a positive source for people to watch. So I want to ask you both, for someone that's watching this, that's going through a hard time, um, maybe they lost their job, maybe they lost a loved one, they're just not happy right now. What would you both say to inspire and uplift them and give them hope? I would all, I, I think about, well, two things come to mind um, as it relates to personal hope. I always think about the fact that as Martin's father said, sometimes when it's darkest, that's the only time you can see the stars. And sometimes in the midst of um, total emotional, physical, mental, um, darkness, that's the time more than anything that we, you have to look for the stars, look for something greater than yourself. And again, when you think about um, stars in the inky black of night, sometimes it's just that little glimmer, just that one shining small glimmer that will get you through. And always, um, dawn always and daybreak always follows um, the darkness of, of night. So if you're in, in that, always just continue to look for the stars. Just look for the little bit of, of goodness or, or something um, in, in, your, in your world to get you through 
to the um, the next day and just remember that every one of our scars can be turned into stars. And as it relates to the the world in general, I, I think quite often of Mahatma Gandhi. And when he talked about that, when he despairs um, and when he thinks that um, evil or, or is, is winning out, he thinks about throughout history that those who um, murderers and tyrants and tyranny they always looked invincible um, for a moment. But when you really think about it, the way of goodness and truth and beauty always wins, always. And he said, think about it always. And so no matter how chaotic it looks or how it, it, it seems or feels that um, even from that we may seem farther from the beloved community or does peace, justice and equity and love really works when you really think about it it always has been the only thing that has kept humanity moving forward. And I would say that uh, that was, that was um, wonderful. I would say, you initially started with an old football analogy, and that is, um, you know, quitters never win and winners never quit. Mm -hmm. So it is really about a foundation, and no matter how dark it gets, I often think about, the plight of certain people. Mr. Mandela stayed in jail for 27 years for doing nothing wrong, mm -hmm. that is. Mm -hmm. And yet he didn't come out bitter and hostile and uh, with his hands, I can't do anything. He came out and became the first black head of state of that country. Mm -hmm. um, but there are so many examples of people. There are inventors who worked on a project a thousand times and it finally became something that changed the world. Uh, we often hear about the victories, but we don't hear about the, the story that they had to go through to get to the victory. Um, you know, it, there's an old saying in church tradition, weeping may endure for a day, but joy cometh in the morning. And no matter how bad a situation may seem at that moment, you lose a job or you lose a, a close friend or relative, uh, you know, I... I personally lost a dad at 10 years old. At 11 years old, my uncle, my father's brother, mysteriously drowned. At 16, my grandmother was gunned down in the church. So I had to overcome the, these tragedies. And every one of us has something. Into everyone's life, rain sometimes falls. Uh, sometimes you get knocked down. Oftentimes, in fact, you may get knocked down. But you have to get back up. Yeah. And when you get back up, you have to somehow stay focused uh, and 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 really uh, derive some level of hope and inspiration. And you know, often for me, it it, it has been prayer, it has been meditation, um, it has been looking elsewhere, um, and and looking out of one's own self because you you can wallow in your own pity. It is so true in life that your attitude determines your altitude yeah so you, you've got to tune eat no matter how hard it is it always goes back to where you start what you think about and where you want to be is what you can become but if you're always thinking and focusing on negative unfortunately that's what you're going to get but if you're always thinking and knowing that you can create positive that is what you will get. I think that's great advice. My mom always says that your attitude, um, you know, it dictates basically everything. If you have a great attitude, and you can overcome anything. And you also talked about an inventor that failed a thousand times. That's it's actually Colonel Sanders. He failed a thousand times, and uh, yeah, after that, he was successful. That's always something I remind myself when I fail. I always remind myself, you know what, Colonel Sanders failed a thousand times. I need to try one more time. So <laughs> I, I love and that advice. So many, yeah, so so many, many of our greats, so you know, you think about the fact that Michael Jordan did not, he Make was cut from his high, basketball, school basketball high school basketball team. team. Yeah. You know, but he was stable before and after practices. When you, when you think about, I mean, I, I mean, you could just, you know, I, I mean, the, the authors that, you know, ended up, you know, with these bestsellers, but they were, didn't, um, declined, you know, many, many times when you think about, um, then, yeah. Abraham Lincoln or, you know, others that, you know, that that were elected to office after having 
um, failed in elections many times. I mean, you will not find any great story of anyone that has done anything significant in this world that also did not also face tremendous amount of um, challenges and, and, adversity. and adversity. Absolutely. And that's what really my show is about, is to talk about the failures, obstacles, so that my, my audience is inspired. But I want to thank both of you so much for coming on the show. It's really been an honor. And thank you for you know, taking the time to do this. So I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank you for thank you. what you do you. in the world, thank continuing so to, to be a light. Absolutely. To guide others. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Tag TV is available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple and Android TVs, as well as on Apple and Android phones. Watch live to YouTube and Facebook. Mm -hmm.